scoot in? Do you mind if I just scoot in? They're very cute. What? What was that? Oh boy. Hello there everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today we are going to be continuing the complete guide to spellwork series, honing in on tools and ingredients. This series follows my book as a video companion. It doesn't go into as much depth as the book does, but it's meant to be there for those of you that learn better through video or are just hoping to have a more well-rounded view of each chapter and understanding. Again, the book does go into far more depth with each of these and has far more information than I will be sharing within this spellcraft series. So. If you want more, I would recommend reading the book and getting it. I will have all of the links for it down below, but this will be supplemental and helpful. And if you wanna follow along with me, you can find this chapter on page 37. In the meantime, if you don't have the book, this video will still be of use to you. So like I said before, we will be focusing in on the tools and ingredients of the craft, focusing mainly on the ones relating to green witchcraft and herbal magic, as these are the paths that I follow. While there are more tools and all sorts of different practices that I won't be covering today, this is a good base understanding for this style of spell work, and it'll serve as a pretty stable jumping off point for anything else you may be looking to study. But before we go any further, this video is sponsored, so let's hear a bit more about that. Thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Scentbird is one of my all-time favorite sponsors, and I'm very grateful to get to work with them again, and especially for this video. Fragrances fit in wonderfully when it comes to talking about tools of the craft. When worn, they help it to enhance the energy we are working with, much like our bundles or incense do, making Scentbird a perfect match for today's video. Personally, I work with fragrances to help set an intention for the day, picking scents that tie to whatever I'm hoping to work toward. And with Scentbird, I have more options to choose from than ever before. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that allows you to try new designer fragrances each month for just $17, some of which would otherwise cost over $150 or even $300 to $500 for a full bottle. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30-day supply to try the new fragrances before deciding if you want to buy the full-size bottle. This month, I received Incense Water, Reflect, Stag, and the Eighth. With notes of bergamot, rose, and sandalwood, Incense Water feels confident. Reflect is light and airy with notes of lemon and lotus, and the eighth is soft and light due to its notes of bergamot and cashmere. With Scentbird, you can experiment with different fragrances to find one that best suits you. They have perfumes and colognes and plenty of unisex options as well. So if this sounds interesting to you, make sure to click the link below to visit Scentbird's website or scan the QR code and use my code MARGARET for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. That's only about $8 for your first month. Thank you again to Scentbird for sponsoring, and let's get back to the video. Alrighty, welcome back. Let's dive in. When it comes to magical practice, tools can take shape in many forms. They can be purchased, handmade, found items. Many, if not all, of the tools used in this style of craft can be found fairly readily within the home or from nature. And I am personally of the opinion that a tool shouldn't be too difficult to come by, unless you want to go out of the way to find something just perfect. But in general, most things will do. A handful of the tools we'll talk about today have a home in folklore and myth, something like the wand or the cauldron. These are core symbols of the witch and things that we've seen throughout history, or even a broom. Each of these three tools serve as very distinct, identifiable witchcraft items, and there's good reason for that. But in addition to these more folkloric tied tools, we also have a ton of tools that are more practical in nature, and these all overlap. Practically speaking, something like knives or shears, cutting boards, strainers, these are very useful tools in a herb-based practice, but so are brooms and cauldrons or cooking pots, and even a wand, which we may call a spoon, but more on that in a bit. Now, of course, as this video will probably be mostly focused on tools, it's also focused on ingredients. And while that may seem like two very separate distinctions, there are a lot of items that blur the line, and this is something I'm very excited to delve into with you. While this concept may not seem super important up front, 
how we work with a tool versus an ingredient is very different in spellcraft. In a very general sense, tools tend not to carry energy for the spell. They usually are conduits for energy. We work through them or they serve a more practical purpose. We can look at this with a wand or a spoon. A spoon can be used to stir a oil, sure, but it can also be used to help focus and infuse the energy and intent of your spell into it. In that sense, it's serving as a conduit of energy. But the spoon itself doesn't really hold any power but that that you lend it. And in a practical sense, they can be used. Maybe you are cutting the herbs that you want to use for a spell. The act of cutting the herb doesn't have to have a magical application to it. It could just be a purely practical harvesting process. So again, tools in general don't really hold a lot of energy except that that we lend to them. A pair of shears isn't going to pick itself up and cut flowers for you, nor is a spoon going to begin to stir a pot for you. Magical tools alone do not have the power to enact change. They rely on us. However, on the other hand, ingredients of a spell do contain energy, either functioning as a source of power for the spell or a vessel for it. Now, sometimes something we may consider a tool usually may function as an ingredient in certain spells. Jars are perhaps one of my favorite examples of this. They are often used to house ingredients, store oils, be temporary vessels for workings, but they don't remain with it at the end. They are used for mundane tasks, but are not typically, in a lot of instances, imbued with the final intent of the spell. However, this is not the case in something like a jar spell, where the jar is the vessel for the spell. It is a core component and ingredient of it, and is where the intent is finally imbued. In the instance of a jar being used to melt beeswax or contain an oil, it is being used as a tool. In the instance of it being used in a jar spell, it is an ingredient. In another sense, a lot of tools are made out of wood. Now we can do this with choice, picking wood for certain spoons or other magical items for its folkloric ties and choosing something that is protective for protective workings, choosing something that is purifying for purifying workings. But in most instances, that wooden spoon is still considered a tool over an ingredient. It just has a little extra oomph of power to it. On the other hand, many woods can be used as ingredients in spells. Something like cedar, juniper, cinnamon. These are all woody plants and herbs that we use as ingredients, and when they're added to spells as the herb individually, they're an ingredient. Whereas when they're used in a tool, they are a tool. Another example is a candle. It may be used as a tool to serve as a light for whatever you are working on, or it could be the primary ingredient of a spell candle. And another thing that pushes the bounds even further is an herb bundle, something that can work as a spell in and of itself, or be used as a tool to cleanse the space prior to a working. So it's not entirely cut and dry across the board, what one thing is, whether it's a tool or not, it ultimately comes down to how it's used. But for the most part, if what you're using gets put away at the end of the day and does not remain a part of the final spell, it is most likely a tool. Now, of course, at this point, it is worth noting that tools are not an essential piece of practice. Now, it would be incredibly difficult to complete many different kinds of spells without the help of tools, as you do need them to make jars or candles or oils and tinctures. A lot of times they are a key component of that craft, but you don't need to collect all of them right away to begin practice, nor do you need all types of tools ever. Tools serve as conduits of your own energy. They are there to help form the spell and focus it. They can both be a great aid and also a hindrance at times, depending on how you best work. If you're somebody who's uncomfortable with the show of things, having tools and using too many of them can be distracting from the overall process. But on the other hand, if you're somebody who really benefits from having this extra 
bit to focus in on and hone your energy in with, then it can be of great aid. So at the end of the day, it really does come down to, once again, each individual practitioner, what works best for you and feels the most comfortable. Your comfort may ebb and flow with time. You'll maybe prefer to work with a ton of tools initially and very few later on, or maybe you start with very few and it grows, or it just changes forever or more. There aren't a ton of rules. Just take care and do whatever suits you best. All right, with that out of the way, let's jump into the tools. Starting first with the wand, or rather the spoon. The wand is perhaps one of the most well-known and visually tied witchcraft tool. In the most traditional sense, it is used to direct energy. And while in many traditional forms of witchcraft, we may see it as this perfectly straight piece of wood with maybe a pointy end, in green witchcraft and herbal practice, we often work with spoons, though you will see me every now and again with a chopstick as a stirring implement as well. This is a vital tool to herbal practice. It's used to mix teas, stir oils, melt beeswax into salves, make jams or other concoctions. It is a huge part of the crafting process. If of course you find yourself working in medicinal or culinary practices here. And though I may favor a spoon in many of these instances, it still works the same as a wand as a tool used to direct energy. Personally, I'm very fond of a wooden spoon, though you can use other materials if you prefer. Just keep in mind if it is a porous material and you are somebody who tends to work with poisonous plants as well as edible ones, it's worth having separate spoons as to uh, keep yourself safe and everybody that you share your creations with. Safe and alive and healthy and happy as well. And of course, make sure they are not identical and that the one you use for edible preparations is food safe. And of course, if you're working with a wooden spoon, you may choose to craft it or purchase one out of certain types of wood for the correspondences that that houses. This isn't necessary, but it is a wonderful way to add a bit of power if you prefer. Ultimately, again, the tool relies on the energy that we give it, so it shouldn't be a big stressor to make sure it is the certain kind of wood for every working. Any wooden spoon will do. Find or craft one that feels comfortable to you and it will work wonders in your craft. The next tool we'll be talking about is yet again another very classic witchy tool and that is the cauldron or the pot. Well, I myself do own a few cauldrons. I primarily work with pots and pans in my practice for the more practical applications of them. Though, of course, you can still work with a cauldron if you prefer. They are a bit more challenging to come by, but it is rather exciting when you do find them. The cauldron or the pot serves as a vessel for energy to be poured into and transformed. It can also be used as a safe place to house a burning candle, a burning herb bundle, or loose incense. It's a very central aspect to hearthcraft practices and green witchcraft practices, and in many senses is married to the wand, as the two tend to work together. I use pots for crafting salves and oils, anything that would be placed over a flame or requires heat. They are a very useful tool to have on hand and a very core aspect of that style of craft. Next up, we will be talking about the mortar and pestle. This is a key tool when it comes to crafting many medicinal style preparations, along with something like loose incense. The mortar and pestle do have some similarities to the cauldron and the wand. In a sense, the mortar is the vessel where energy is transformed, whereas the pestle is the wand that infuses the energy. While I do believe that this tool is something that can be omitted in many crafts depending on how you practice, it is valuable to have around. And in the same sense as the wand or the spoon, it is useful to have one for non-edible preparations and edible preparations. The next tools I wanna to talk about are knives and shears. 
some of the ones I use the most. In many styles of more traditional witchcraft, knives have been used for ages as a very symbolic tool, often used to cut or direct energy. But in green witchcraft and herbal practices, they tend to serve a far more practical purpose, used during the harvesting process or the preparation process. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't use knives or shears as a energetic component to the spell, just that they will be far more commonly used as a very practical tool. Now, there are many opinions on what a knife or your shears should be made of or look like, but personally, I am of the opinion that whatever works is the best for you. It doesn't matter if the blade is fixed or foldable, if the hilt is wooden or metal, as long as you can use it to harvest herbs, cut them up in a preparation, inscribe candles, or cut twine, then they're pretty good. You may wish to inscribe the handle of them or choose one made with a certain type of wood. Of course, again, it's really up to you to find a tool that suits you best. I am very fond of using a pair of iron shears for most of my harvesting, and I use a lot of paring knives for most of my work. But at times I have to choose other tools that just come out of my kitchen. Now onto the broom, another very classic witchcraft tool. This can be used in many magical or practical applications. Magically speaking, it is very commonly used to sweep the energy of a space, but practically you can use it to clean up after you have made a giant mess crafting all day. Or if you're like me, you can work those two systems together. Some people choose to have separate brooms, some that are only meant for magical workings, whereas others are only meant for practical. Some have some that have blurred lines and some just use their regular kitchen broom for it all. I have gone back and forth in my practice on this, but I am of the opinion nowadays that any broom will do. Next up are incense and herb bundles. While these can be worked as a spell in their own right, they are often used as tools to cleanse the space prior to a working, or enhance the energy of the space prior to a working or during the working. In these instances, they are there to focus energy and serve as tools, while also serving as a spell. Now, because they are made of herbs and are typically bound together with a very specific intention, they do tend to work with more of an energetic imprint than most tools do. They have their own magical presence beyond that that we lend them but again if they are put away at the end of the day and not included in the final spell then they are serving as a tool in that instance and i do tend to keep quite a few of them around for that use next the tool slash ingredient that i absolutely have the most of jars and bottles as I kind of mentioned earlier, jars can serve a very practical purpose. They work to house herbs or store an oil that's infusing, so on and so forth. But again, they can also serve as the ingredient in something like a jar spell. Because I already delved into them a bit earlier, I'm not gonna dive too deep into them again, but I do just wanna say that jars are such a valuable thing to have on hand. I tend to prefer ones of glass, I save all of the ones that I get from food or medicine. They're easy to repurpose and work in many different fashions. They can be any size, any material, whatever suits your needs best. And I personally am of the opinion that you can never have too many. Another interesting tool or ingredient is cord or twine. Now, I did initially question if I wanted to add cords and twine as a tool in my book, but I do use them often enough and with enough different uses that I feel like they're worth noting and delving into a little deeper than just a list. Twine tends to most often arguably work as an ingredient because it tends to be left with most spells like a herb bundle or uh, something that is hanging. Perhaps they tie off a spell bag even. 
but in general cords and twine tend not to have any energy except for that that we lend to them save those made from certain materials or are handmade from nature by you but it can also be used very practically uh, to tie up drying herbs situations of that sort and it's a big part of a lot of traditional practices like cord cutting spells or knot spells so definitely worth having in your collection of tools now finally of the big explanation tools used this isn't exactly a tool but i do feel this is the best place to discuss it and um, that is the altar or the workspace an altar or a magical workspace while not exactly a tool is a dedicated area of magical practice this can be anything that allows you enough space to work you may choose to decorate it seasonally with symbols of your practice there are many ways to work magic into this space and really no hard and fast rules unless you are following specific traditions. But in general, I am of the opinion that your workspace should be practical and accessible to you and be a reflection of you and your practice. Mine is filled with plants and tools that I use all the time. It's counter height and it's got quite a large working space. It is absolutely perfect for my practice and I couldn't imagine working with anything else nowadays. But this workspace has gone through many transitions in my life, I've worked in many different places, and it is up to you to find what suits you best. Now beyond this, I do have a list of other implements that you may find useful in practice. This includes a cutting board or two, one for edibles and one for non-edible plants, a kitchen scale, baskets for foraging, storing, and drying, cloth bags of various sizes, clothespins for hanging herbs to dry, cloth kitchen towels or tea towels for cleaning and straining, measuring cups and spoons, metal funnels, sieves and colanders, a sturdy pair of gloves for gathering and working with thorny herbs, and various bowls, cups, or other vessels for short-term storage, collection, mixing, etc. This is by no means a finite list of tools. These are simply the base ones that I suggest for anybody seeking to work with herbal practice. But you also don't have to use all of these if you prefer not to. I find most of them useful, but depending on the style of your craft, you may not need all of them. So again, work with what feels comfortable to you. Now, one final very important note when it comes to tools. Each time you receive, craft, or purchase a new tool, it is of value to cleanse said tool and give it a base new energy. You may also wish to just do this from time to time to reset it. Tools can tend to hold on to energy that has previously been lent to it, so this is especially important if you pick up tools from thrift stores or secondhand shops, but it is of good practice across the board. I do have a cleansing spell in the book, but in general, washing the tool or sprinkling a bit of a thyme infusion on them can work wonders. And in a pinch, just regular water will do. Make sure to dry them off completely though so that they maintain their health and longevity. And with that, there is our talk on tools and ingredients. There is more to ingredients, something that I do want to cover in depth slowly. In herbal practice, this tends to be most of the time purely herbs. Herbs come in so many different shapes and sizes with so many different ties to folklore and power and intent. They are so incredibly diverse and useful and to sit down and try to cover all of that in one video is impossible. I do intend on continuing an herbal series, but for those of you that are interested, I do share monthly herbal profiles on my Patreon. They're a deep dive into a single herb that you can read and access and learn a great deal on its folkloric ties and magical uses. But again, I will begin sharing more of those here in some time. And with that, thank you so much for watching. If you can and would like to, I'd really appreciate it if you checked out my Patreon. There I share art, herbal profiles, book recommendations, and monthly workshops. I also have a, another channel where I share more of loggy things, more herbalism and magic and just day-to-day -day life. And again, I wrote a book. So if you want that, 
along with any of the other things. They will all be linked in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a lovely day and I can't wait to see you again soon.